from declaration to dedication. That's, that's a good flow. And that we see a, a flow going through this chapter of Colossians 1 that we've been looking at this week where the Apostle Paul shares, first of all, his thoughts of them and his prayer for them, but then he moves into what he hopes they will hold firm in their heart. He declares to them the truth about Jesus. I want to share with you, I, I asked Tim Minky if he would be here to read it himself. He wrote it this week, but he's with the confirmation class as they are at Friendship Baptist Church today. But he wrote about his reflections on Colossians 1, and I want to share this with uh, all of us together. Hopefully you've read it yourself this week. By the way, if you don't have one of the Shape by the Word devotional books, uh, get one uh, today if, as long as they last. We'll make more up as we need them. We don't mind if you take one for every member of your family. Uh, this is produced in-house, and we can produce as many as we need. And it's kind of a personal journal book, so we want you to be able to write down your own thoughts in here and not have your wife or your mom or somebody, your dad or your brother writing all over the book where you want to write. All right, have your own. Tim says this, From my youth, I have been a religious person, I grew up in the Catholic Church and had a solid intellectual understanding of who Jesus was, or so I thought. He was God's Son who came to earth to die for our sins. He was a great man who lived a perfect life. He rose from the dead and will someday return. All these statements about Jesus are true. However, they don't dig deep enough and fully explain who Jesus is in his totality and then Tim goes on to say in 2004 I surrendered my life to Jesus and traded my religion for a relationship and since that time I have grown in my understanding of Jesus Christ by digging deeper into his word Colossians chapter 1 was slash is a game changer for me and my thoughts about Jesus. And I can relate totally to what Tim is saying here. For me, it was when I was in high school and I began to read the Bible um, out of my own personal interest to want to know what it said, particularly in the New Testament, to guide me in how to live a life as a Christian, as a teenager in high school. And I came upon Colossians chapter 1, and when I read that, I thought, wow. I didn't know that about Jesus. Here's what Tim goes on to say. He says, not only is Jesus God's son, our savior, our redeemer, and our friend, he is the very one who created all things. Everything that exists was created by God through Christ. Jesus holds all things together. You and I and our families continue to exist because Jesus says so. He is so much more than my church thoughts of him as I was growing up. He is everything. And that kind of sums up what Paul says here in verses uh, 15 through 22. You have this outline that I've put in the bulletin for you because I've, one of the things I want you to notice is how this particular chapter lends itself to being outlined. Not all chapters, not all the parts of the Bible that we read, can you do that? But this is one of the methods of studying the Bible. We've shared some others uh, in the past weeks, you know, looking for things that are repeated, uh, using study helps and cross-references, uh, comparing different versions. Well, here's another way to dig into the Bible, and that is by outlining it. So I want to outline what Paul says about Christ very quickly here. I know there's nine points, but I'm not going to dwell on each one. We want to sail through this and get to communion because that's where this all points anyway. But it says in verse 15, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the one who is first over all creation. So the first thing we note is that Jesus is God visible. He is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the image. That is, when we look at Jesus, we can see what God is like. When we see Jesus, 
with the Samaritan woman at the well, tenderly listening to her life story and pointing her to the direction of truth, we see God. When we see Jesus with a seeking and searching Pharisee named Nicodemus, we see God. When we see Jesus with Mary and Martha weeping with them at the tomb of their brother who has just died, we see the heart of God. When we see Jesus with Peter who has just recently denied him three times, Jesus offers love and acceptance. We see the heart of God. Jesus is God in a way that we can see him. Tom Skinner, an evangelist that I heard many, many years ago when I was first starting out in the past as a pastor, I heard him t tell a story in a sermon. There was a family who, who was trying to sleep through a very stormy night. And the, the, the wind was howling, the rain was beating against the windows, there was uh, lightning flashing and thunder crashing, and the little girl, the four-year-old, got really scared and came running into her mom and dad's bedroom, and she said, Mommy, Daddy, I'm afraid. Can I sleep with you? And the dad says, No, no, honey, you don't need to be afraid. Just go back and get in bed. God is with you. So she went back, and the storm kept on going. She got afraid again. She ran into her mother and dad's room again and said, I'm really afraid. Can I sleep with you? No, I told you. God's with you. Go back and get in bed. Third time, as the storm seemed to increase in intensity, the little girl came running in and said, Mommy, Daddy, please let me get in bed with you. But I told you God is with you. She says, Daddy, God don't have no skin on him. I can't feel God. I can't see God like I can see you and Mom. In other words, we need to see God. And in Jesus, God makes the invisible essence of himself visible to us. Jesus says, to the disciples he who has seen me has seen what the father and then it goes on to say because all things were created by him both in the heavens and on the earth the things that are visible and the things that are invisible whether they are thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things were created through and for him the second point jesus is the creator of everything you know, I had always known that very first the verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created. And in my mind, I'm thinking God the Father. He, he did the creating. It was God the Son who was the agent of creation. That means that when Jesus came into the world, the baby in the Bethlehem manger is the person who created the whole universe. Now try to wrap your mind about that sometime this afternoon. Goes on to say, He existed before all things, and all things are held together in Him. Two points in this brief verse. He existed before anything else. Jesus is kind of reiterating what He's just said. If, obviously, if, if Jesus created everything, then He had to be here before everything. But it also says that he is, Jesus comes from outside of space and time. We don't know anything except space and time. We, we, we know our birth date. We don't know our death date yet, but some days somebody will know when we died. We have a finite time. We live in space and time uh, a continuum. But Jesus is outside of all that. He preexisted time. Time doesn't mean anything to Jesus. He lives in eternity. He existed before anything else. And the fourth point is he holds everything together. I like what Tim says in here. He says, you and I and our families continue to exist because Jesus says so. He holds us together. And the way, the way he holds the universe together is he put laws in place, laws of physics and gravity and, and, and chemistry and all, all, the, all the different uh, aspects of, of the physical realm. Jesus put it all in place. He holds it together. He makes it work. It goes on to say in verse 18, He is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the one who is firstborn from among the dead, so that he might occupy the first place in everything. There's two things here. He is the head of the church, and he is, he is the first one who has conquered death. As the head of the church... As we go about being grace churches, seeking to fulfill who we're supposed to be, 
we must never forget we did not establish this church and by we I, I mean not only us but not only but neither did those who preceded us, the preceding generations going all the way back, even the Methodist circuit riders who came across the American frontier in the early 1800s. They did not create the church. John Wesley did not create the church. Christ has established the church. He says in the Gospels that I will build my church. And he is the head, both in the sense that he is head like uh, the CEO, the the, the head of an organization but he's also like the head of the body the whole body operates because the mind the, 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 the head it directs your hands, your feet, your eyes your lips Jesus is to be the head of the church sometimes we in doing church forget about that and we act as if uh, all the decisions were up to us that's why when we have meetings where we make decisions or set policies or adopt missions, we need to do it prayerfully, seeking the guidance of the head for what we do. And then the first one who conquered death, not only did Jesus, who created the world, who, who, who designed the marvels of human life, the body, how, how our we live our lives he, he designed all that but then he submitted himself to go through the process of dying why because he was going to conquer death he has conquered death for you and me yes our physical bodies will die but that's only releasing us to the fullness of life that comes for eternity death is no longer anything to dread other than the fact that we don't want to be separated from loved ones you know at least not today I don't do you <laughs> you know we live life to the fullest as long as God gives us life, but then when death comes to us, we know that Jesus has conquered death. He's the first one, meaning others will also overcome death. Each of us. And then verse 19, because all the fullness of God was pleased to live in him God's fullness is in Jesus it's not that Jesus was with somebody that God preeminently used and showed uh, how he can use a human being he can use you and me but it's not like uh, Jesus uh, was, was used by God in that way no Jesus is has all of the essence of divinity the divine nature in him that's part of the miracle of the incarnation how could God the son who created the universe come into the world as a human being limit himself so that he's no longer uh, using his, his divine powers and prerogatives but he's trusting in the father as he lives life just as we do that's the miracle of the incarnation. All the fullness of God was fully embodied in Jesus. In verse 20, and he reconciled all things to himself through him, whether things on earth or in the heavens, he brought peace through the blood of his cross. Jesus came into the world to redeem us from the clutches and the consequences of our sin he has reconciled us to God not that God had to be won over to accept us it was God's idea to send Jesus into the world in the first place for God so loved the world that he sent his son no Jesus is reconciling us to God he's drawing our hearts back to God's heart so that finally in verse 22 he can present you before God as a people who are holy faultless and without blame Jesus presents you to God as a righteous and holy person holy faultless and without blame now I think I'm pretty good but I've never thought I was any of those things holy faultless or without blame I'm not there yet you're not there yet but that is what Jesus is going to do with each of us because we're not going to heaven and 
act in the way we do here. As we are redeemed, our resurrected life will be a life where we are no longer We, we are no longer susceptible to those sinful tendencies and attitudes and actions that hinder us here. We will be presented to God as a holy people without fault, ready for heaven. Now, all that is wonderful. And Jesus is, I mean, uh, Paul is, is writing this about Jesus so that the people at Corinth will remain steadfast in their determination to live for him you know the question with any class lesson any lecture any sermon is to present information that's the what to present why people should be interested that's the so what and then to show people what to do with it that's the now what Paul says this is who Jesus is this is who you've come to know it makes all the difference in our life to know that God has a will and a purpose for us God has a plan to work in and through our lives and so Paul says this as he closes this uh, part of the chapter he says to them in verse 23 after saying all this, he says, but you need to remain well established and rooted in faith and not shift away from the hope given you. With all that God has done for us, he calls us to abide in that certainty, to not be shifted away from it. That's why we encourage our, ourselves to be growing in discipleship, getting into God's word so that God's word gets into us. That verse there where Jesus, where Paul says, he brought peace through the blood of his cross. That brings us to communion. We have the bread and the cup reminding us that Jesus took upon himself our guilt, our separation from God so that we could be reconciled. I'd like for Pastor Casey to come lead us in prayer of consecration as we prepare to receive communion. Would those who are going to serve come and take your positions, please?